Take your Bibles this evening to James chapter 4, where we've been for a few weeks now. And we've been looking at the section of verses 1 through 10, and we're going to close that out this evening. But again, for context, let's go and read from verse 1 in James chapter 4. It says here in God's word, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, but he gives more grace. Therefore, God says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then in our text for tonight, James goes on to continue to say, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And may the Lord bless that reading of his word and the listening of his word to our ears, to our hearts, to our minds, to our lives. If, if I titled it, and I, and I have, the, the title of the message this evening is The Greatest Fixer. And I hope by the end, the title makes sense when we, when we look at the whole of the scripture in these verses 1 through 10. James, James is not speaking of or to lost people. He, he's speaking to Christians. Lost people are not spiritually unfaithful because they have not made that relationship with God. So they're not verse 4. Also, James constantly calls us, or calls the readers here, brethren, and he talks to them as they are children of God. So, this text is talking to those who've sinned or in sin, that they've drifted, they've gone away from God. And what James is giving them and us through the Holy Spirit is the fixer of all of that. You know, this is the greatest fixer, the fixer of our relationship with God when we go astray in sin. And it's also in this text, the fixer of our of relationships with other people, especially in the church where our sin has caused an effect in that relationship. Like with them in our text, they're fighting and quarreling and bickering among themselves because of sin that is is in their life. And, and, and so James is giving them that which fixes those relationships. And I think as Christians, we, we focus on the love of God. We focus on the redemption. We focus on the emotion and the feeling. But I think we ought never to forget how destructive sin is. Sin destroys. It rips apart relationships uh, with with our Lord, with other people. It affects our testimony. It's ugly. Sin is horribly ugly. And it happens within the church. You know, my notes say, and it can happen. Well, it does. It, it happens within the church among God's people. And the answer to all of this, the answer to broken relationship, whether it's with God or with others, is the fact that we need God's help. You know, in the earlier part of James, in verse 2 and 3, it says, You want what you don't have, so you scheme about 
and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it from them. You don't have what you want because you won't ask God for it, and when you do ask God for it, you don't get it because your motives, your desires are all wrong. The whole context is they're selfish so that you can enjoy it amongst your own sinful, lustful kind of desires. You only want, the end of that verse, verse 3, what will give you pleasure. And so what James tells us to combat all that is you need to acknowledge that first. You, you know, I hope not to laugh because it breaks my heart. I don't know how many times people have said, wow, pastor, great message, really spoke to me, blah, blah, blah. But yet they would forego one major concern in their life is, and that's the repentance of sin. You, you, you know, we can't, you know, you go to church and you, 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 you call yourself a Christian, we call ourselves Christians, but that comes with a responsibility to not be an adulterer or an adulteress, to be faithful, not to go head first desiring the things of the world and, 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 and become in enmity with God. The Bible tells us in verse 6, he gives grace. He gives abundant grace. He gives crazy kinds of amounts of grace. He gives us all the grace, that, that help that we need as believers, but he only gives it in that context, in that abundant measure to those who acknowledge it, acknowledge their sin, acknowledge our sin. God, the Bible says God resists the proud. He doesn't give it to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God helps us, but not the one that does not acknowledge, fear, repent of their sin and the effects that it has in their life. You know, arrogance and pride on our part keeps God in a sense ineffective in our life when it comes to our relationship with him. And so James is really saying what that church needed to do, those Christians, was to acknowledge their need for his help. You know, even in a secular world, you know, they acknowledge the fact that before someone can progress, go forward in their life, they've got to, to be helped with the, the issues that they have in life. They have to need their, to, they have to acknowledge their need for help. Am I right? Try to help someone that doesn't think they need help. I got it. I'm good. I'm all right. I don't need your involvement. And yet from the outside, we know they do need our involvement. But until they acknowledge it, they won't receive it. Same with God. You have to acknowledge your need for help. And God will then give you the grace. But that's only the beginning. It's an awesome beginning. Because when we do that, he gives us that more abundant, gracious help of his. But the Bible says not only do we need to acknowledge our need and our condition, but we need to submit to the authority of God in our life, scripturally, relationally, and resist Satan as he comes and tempts us. Verse 7, and I, and, and I won't go into any more detail than that. Because you can go back and watch the last couple of weeks where we went into great detail on submit and resist. But verse 7 says, Therefore, because you know you need God's help, then submit to his authority and resist the devil, and he will quickly flee from you. And then our text tonight. James 7, 4, 7 through 10 is not a list of one, two, three, four, five, do this, you be good. It is a conglomeration. It is a unit. It is a, a humble yourself, submit to God. As you submit to God, resist Satan. As you submit and resist, here's what you do. Verse eight, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Oftentimes, we as Christians do not like hard language. But here's what James said. James is saying, you're unfaithful. The sin in your life 
isn't just bad. It's just not wrong. It is causing you to be unfaithful to your relationship with me, an adulterer and adulteress. He says, you are sinners. You are doing that which is not in accord with who Christ is, with who Jesus is. You know, I hate the fact that Christians, as Christians, we look so lightly upon sin. This is horrible stuff. It's destructive. It's a killer. Um, it's a disease. It's it, and, and if it is not dealt with, it grows and defiles even more. He says, you know, they've drifted away. And that was shown by what they were doing. The fighting, the arguing, the discontent, the contention that was within the church. And they were double-minded. You know, double-minded is that they were divided in their loyalty between God and this world. In one part of their life, they wanted God and his blessings. But in the other part, they wanted the satisfaction that, that the giving into temptation gives to their lustfulness. And that was the battle that was going on in their life. You know why? Because they weren't resisting the devil. They were not submitting to God's authority in, in their life. And they were not drawing close to him. So what do people like that do? What do people like us? Because there's not one person on the Zoom. There's not one person watching the YouTube video that, that you will not sin. You know, we will fall short. John, the letter, 1 John, it tells us that if you say you're not you do not sin. You're a liar. You know, we all sin. It might not be alcohol and it might not be drugs and it might not be, you know, uh, some kind of sexual sin, but it could be anger in our heart, bitterness within us, you, you know, um, uh, not, not uh, obeying what God has told us to do, like Jonah running from God when he said, Jonah, go to those people who need me. You know, we, we will sin. So what does, I say Jesus, because he's the living word. It is his spirit that gave the word to James. He didn't create it on his own. He said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. you he will be that help to you. He will be that comfort to you. He will be that character changing power in your life come close to god the lord the savior in your relationship and he will come close to you now this is the time in which you will think i'm going to say read your bible pray go to church three times a week or our church ever how many times we're allowed to have church dude it is so much more than that drawing close to god is so much more than just reading your bible and talking to Jesus. That's great. But there's got to be more to it than that. See the word here James uses. Is, is, the, is a word that is a command. And an encouragement. To those who are far away. Relatively in sin. From God because of the things that they're doing. You know they've gotten away from God. And he's saying to them. Come close to the Lord. And he's saying, especially those of you who've been, who are, who are double-minded, you're flirting with the world and God at the same time. They don't mix. Come close to the Lord. So you want, you want an answer to, to being unfaithful? You want an answer to the failure to resist sin? You, you, you want an answer to the struggles that we have in our life. It's this right here. Come close to God. Because that word draw means come. Come close to God. He will come close to you. So how do you do that? How, how do you draw close to God? See, in a way that this has an allusion to Old Testament priests. When they come to the temple, to the tabernacle, to the temple later. And they come close to God. To do what? To serve to minister, to worship, to do the things that he's asked them to do. You want to come close to God. Part of that, yeah, Bible, scripture, church, uh, 
prayer. It's come. It's to come close to God in our lives to serve him. Come close to God in worship of him. Do you know, I don't know about you guys, there have been times I've come to church that I've been kind of cranky. Come to church that where my heart's not been real sensitive to the things of Christ. I'm a people, you know, and I've got family and stuff and, you know, Satan's throwing things at me and, and pressures and all of that. And there have been times that I've come to church and I wanted to be there and, and all, but, you know, I was broken and, 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 you know, the devil was battering my mind and my heart wasn't real sensitive. And then all of a sudden, the church will begin to worship. And I would just listen to them. Listen to them sing. Well, you know, as I come close to the Lord in worship, it's as if he's washing me. You know, he's speaking to my mind. He's speaking to my heart. And I come close to him. And then, I, then I begin to mouth the words and I begin to be worshipful to him. That's coming close. You know, coming close, drawing close to God is serving him in sacrifice and offerings to him. And I don't mean just tithes and monetary offerings, but the offering of your time, the offering of your kindness to others, but to him. You know, the offering of your, your life, the offering of the things that we have been blessed by God. We want to come close to God. We do that. We pray. We are dependent on him. Coming close to God is not just doing certain things, but it's focusing our attention on the living God, being devoted to him relationally in reading our Bible. But you know what? Study your Bible. You don't, we don't have to be theologians to study the Bible. And oftentimes I try to study the Bible, not for a sermon. You know, like this morning, this morning I was, you know, reading uh, Psalms 36 through 39. Well, I actually read 40 because it was so good. I didn't want to stop. And um, I'm, I'm looking up words and I'm scratching in things. and I'm writing stuff and I'm praying as I'm reading scripture. And then I read more and I pray a little bit more. Not because I'm super spiritual, just because I was close to God this morning. I put myself in a position where I could do that and I drew close to him. And meditate on God's word, memorize God's word, consume God's word. But drawing close to God is a not a one-time act. It's not what we do between, set, for me, like 6.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning. Drawing close to God is a life. And it is a lifestyle. One of the best ways to keep ourselves in the right direction is to do tomorrow what you did today for the glory of God and in the things that you do to draw close to him. Drawing close to God is not just a mental or emotional activity. It is a practical response to God. That's the stuff that I was just telling you about. You see... Drawing close to God is responding to God's word, which James has absolutely thoroughly and completely shown to us in the pages that we've already studied. Control your tongue. Hey, when we stop resisting the devil and letting our tongue rip and just saying anything we want, we take a step away from drawing close to God. Control the tongue. James says in 126, if anyone among you thinks he's religious, but doesn't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart and his religion is useless. You know, how, you know another way we can practically respond to the word of God and draw, draw close to him? One of the best ways of doing it is get involved in your church and serve. Little things like care for the poor. Find someone that is in need and be a blessing to them. You know, James says clearly, pure 
An undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in the trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. See, these things won't make us right with God, but they will surely help keep us sensitive to God. Not apart from God's word, through prayer and his spirit, but all together helping us draw close to God. And the Bible says again, uh, James, uh, you know, part of that growing close to God, drawing close to him is growing in his wisdom and peace. You know, 1.5 says, if you lack wisdom, what do you do? Ask. Ask of God. And here's what he does. He who, will get, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. See, this is a verse with promise. The verse we're looking at tonight, the verse here, draw, you draw, and you will come near to God. And when you come near to God, he will come near to you. And often we think of drawing close to God as simply a feeling. If I draw close to God, I will know that, by the feeling that I get like I had this morning and I didn't want devotions to stop. But there are other days that, I, you know, because of my own self, I got so much going on maybe in my head that I can't concentrate. And, I, and I'm like, where was the Lord today? I've read, but I don't feel that deep presence of his. And often that's what we think about when you draw close to God. He's going to give you that warm hug. He does. But that's not exactly what he's talking about here. Oh, it is a feeling at times when we draw close to God and you get that sense of him being close to you. That's true. But it's, and I love that feeling of closeness. But him coming close is also the fact that we become more like him. You want to know a really good measurement of know, knowing that you've drawn close, you've come close to God, that in your character, you're becoming more like him. You're, in a sense, you're visiting in the orphans and the widows. You're controlling your tongue. You're, you're, you're doing the things. You're caring for the poor. That's a really good indicator that we've drawn close to God. Church, are we a church that is drawn close to God where, where we are having these indicators of his closeness in our life? James goes on to say, okay, you want to draw close to God, but you can't bring your sin into that relationship. You can't expect to draw close to God when we're in sin, we can't expect to draw close to God when, when we are without a doubt in reproach of God's word. You can't bring sin into that relationship with the Lord. You can't live a life of divided loyalty between God and the world and think that he will draw close to you just because you read a couple of verses or you say a prayer or you go to a church service. When he means by drawing close to God, you know, you've got to confess that sin. And that's what James means in the next verse when he says, cleanse your hands and purify your heart. Verse 8, draw, and he will draw to you. But then he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. These two commands, cleanse and purify, they're talking about our sin and our heart. It's the, the, he says that there has to be external outward changes. Cleanse your hands. Stop doing the things that you're doing. My heart breaks. Often you know, people come in and, oh, great message, great service, great worship. But then they go and not, the sin 
that is evident in their life stays. The command is very clear. Draw close to God. He will draw close to you. Cleanse your hands. That's, that's that external outward stuff. Stop it. Confess it. Repent of it. And he says, clean your heart. That internal heart that, 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 that needs to be cleaned is required in a repentant sinner. How do you do that? You confess the sin before God. The sin has to be dealt with on our part. And our part is repentance. And repentance is turning our back on that sin and turning to the grace of God for his help. You and I can never be sinless. Read John. John 1, John 2. 1 John 1, 1 John 1, 2. Clear. It tells us. We're never ever going to be clear of sin. But we have Jesus. And we want to be close to him. We want to submit under his authority. We want to resist the devil. Well, we have to acknowledge our need. And we have to repent. Maybe the reason the church isn't seeing revival today is because too many of us want the feeling but not the life committed change to our Savior to live like we should and ask for forgiveness of sins. James simply calls on us to remove everything from our heart, our thoughts, and our actions that keep us from pursuing God. And you think, you say, Steve, hard language you're using. Same language James is using. He says, y'all are sinners. He says, y'all are double-minded. You're unfaithful. You're adulterers, men. You're adulteresses, women. It's pretty harsh language, is it not? That should make us think, where am I? Where am I? How am I? What's going on in my life? Do you, do you know, I've often, I, I stole this from someone else. I don't know who I stole it from probably. But when Lisa and I started going to church, our lives could be dealt with as if the, the word of God was a, was a machete, was a big blade. And the word of God was chopping chunks off of us. But you know, now that, you know, we've come to Christ. Oftentimes, our sin isn't chunky. Our sins are kind of the stuff that's not easily to be seen sometimes. And you know what they need is they need a file. They need the file of God's word this time where it gets deep into the little spots and it works into the nooks and crannies of our heart and our mind, our soul, our being. The truth is, you know what James says? Don't be lackadaisical over sin in your life. And I know that because of what he says in verse 9. Lament, mourn, weep. When it says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom, it, says, it means this. James is talking to the people. says, look, stop dancing and partying and enjoying your fake joy with the things of the world. You need to mourn over what you're doing. You need to grieve. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. This is a true grieving over our condition of our faith before God. You know, I think this is a good thing to do maybe before we come to church on a Sunday. Have a moment where we ponder our life before we walk out the door to walk in the doors of the church. Not because the church place is more holy than our home, but that's where we're coming to focus on the King of Kings, Jesus, and to worship him. And we don't want to bring our offering of ourselves that is polluted. And it's got sin in it. We want to confess it. And let's face it, confessing opens up that relationship again with Jesus and isn't that what we really truly want desperately want is that 
relational experience with our Savior. Why do we grieve? There's a lot of reasons why we would grieve over our sin and be sorrow for it. But one is that it is always stimulated by the realization of how destructive to our relationship, to God, and to people it is for the believer when we do not confess our sin. And what verse 9 is calling us to is not just a feeling, but it's an action. Not just feeling sorry, but an act of repentance. A change of mind, a change of life and action. From adultery to faithfulness. And here's what James says. Guys, you're going through a lot of trials. Living the Christian life in James is not easy. But here's the promise from God's word. In verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. For us as believers, we have the desire to live this life for the Lord, but we can't do it on our own. We can't glorify him on our own. We need his help, but we can't have his help when our hearts divided between the world and him. We need to cut that world off in a sense, look to him, confess our sin, submit to him, resist the temptations, draw near to God, repent, confess whatever needs to be done. And here's what he says, when that humbleness has happened in your life and those things have taken place, he will lift you up. And, that, and what that means is he will give you the power to live this life for his glory. And I hope that's a blessing to us tonight as we've looked at God's word. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that all of us, all of us would have such a, an awareness, a desire to, to be right with you, to be, to be sensitive to you in relationship, acknowledging sin. Lord, I know that in my life, I'm not perfect. And Lord, what happens is we go along and we live and, you know, we think we're like, you know, everything's good. I got nothing wrong in my life. Everything's right and perfect. And all of a sudden in your sweet love towards us, as we are living for you and serving you and being in your word and talking to you and worshiping you in church and serving in ministry, whatever it is. Lord, you reveal things to us. And I pray that's where we would remain. That we wouldn't go off like James's people here and be unfaithful and fall into sin. But that we would stay in that state of relationship with you where we would be sensitive to your voice and hear when you tell us these things need to change, Steve. These things need to come out of your life, Steve. Steve, this is where I'm working in you. And Lord, I pray that I and all of us who hear this would be the, that sensitive. But Father, for those of us when we do sin, when we do become like James's readers tonight and we become unfaithful, Lord God, I pray that you would humble our hearts. I pray that we would acknowledge our need, that we would submit to you that we would live a life of resistance, that we would come close to you and repent and turn to you and give you the glory. Because Lord, we know that when we do sin, we have Jesus, you Christ, who is our advocate. So we thank you again. In Jesus' name.